for joining today. Um, I see that we have, I noticed a few from the Midwest. I didn't know if we had anyone out there from um, other places, possibly warm places. Maybe you can send some sunshine our way. Um, but thank you again for taking time out of your uh, busy days and schedules to, to be with us. So uh, we're going to be looking at authentic learning experiences and taking a look at traditional lessons, uh, lesson planning to uh, versus learning experiences, the benefits of authentic learning experiences, and strategies for creating authentic learning experiences, something you can uh, take away today that you can implement and use in your classroom right away. But before we dive in, we can get a sense of um, who's on the line, uh, what grades you teach, what subject areas, and uh, maybe what are you hoping to learn today? So you see a poll there, and you can go ahead and type in the chat box, and that'll give us an idea of, of uh, you know, who all is out there today. So thank you very much. I'll give you a minute to do that. Excellent. Thank you so much. Looks like we, um, are, we have quite a few elementary, some middle school as well, and all different um, uh, subject areas. So that's fantastic. So um, if you have any questions or anything at all during um, our time together, go ahead and write it in the chat box, and Robin may stop me or may um, you know, address those as well as we're going. But if we take a look at uh, you know, traditional lesson plans, and learning experiences, looking at the differences. And we know that we need a lesson plan. We need to have an idea of what we're doing uh, when those students walk into our classroom. But really taking a look at what is in that lesson plan, like what is, what is being taught. And if we look traditionally at lesson planning, where it was very content specific, the content was taught in silos. Here's your math lesson plan. Here's your uh, science lesson plan. Whereas in a authentic learning experience, we're looking at something that's more cross-curricular. And I know for secondary folks who are middle school and high school teachers out there, uh, you know, sometimes even within our own content areas, whether it's science or math or ELA, you know, there's a lot of content within that area that's um, taught in silos as well. But trying to break those silos down and make that more of a cross-curricular and making those connections between those content areas uh, is at the heart of those authentic learning experiences. You know, traditionally, you know, in lesson plans, you start with the objective, your, your standards, which we know we need. I mean, we have to have standards because that's what we're assessed on. You know, our students are assessed on. But you may be taking those standards and those learning objectives and turning them into a compelling question where the students are engaged and motivated to answer. Uh, traditional lesson plans, looking at the, uh, you know, since the it's in a silo and the, we're looking at specific content areas, they're doing problems within that particular content area. So they're working on a math problem or maybe they're um, reading uh, an English text and they're answering questions about that. Whereas in a learning experience, uh, they're looking at a more global or a more real world problem, something that they can solve that would have a relevancy, whether it's to them personally within the class or outside the classroom walls or even you know, across the globe. In traditional lessons, the work of the students is given to the teacher. The teacher is you know, the primary audience for that work, the assessment, that both that formative and summative assessment, which we need. That's important. We are, the teachers are going to be uh, the, the assessors during that experience. But the learning experiences take a step further, where the students are working on a product or a project and they're delivering it, presenting it to an authentic audience. Again, increasing that, that motivation and engagement. And in traditional lesson plans, um, the instruction is very you know, teacher-driven. And you know, in a learning experience, turning that more into an inquiry experience where the students are given a lot of opportunities for choice, and they're driving that learning process. Uh, lesson plans um, that provide that opportunity for uh, the learning experience are going to allow the students to be engaged. Uh, they're going to be motivated. They're going to be excited because it's something that's relevant to them. And with that, they're also going to be very curious. They're going to want to know answers to questions. They're going to be asking questions. They're going to be researching. And in that, they're going to be coming up with ideas and using creativity and taking those ideas and then trying to um, design solutions um, or products to that problem and using critical thinking to do that. Other benefits of those authentic learning experiences is the students are going to be collaborating. They're going to be collaborating 
not only within the classroom, but there are opportunities for them to collaborate outside the classroom. We'll talk about some ideas later. There's also opportunities for um, that real world connection where uh, the world is brought into the students, whether it's through bringing in experts from your community or Skyping with experts virtually. And also bringing the students to the world, sharing their awesome, what are the awesome cool things that they're doing, and uh, sending that message out to the masses. And we know as teachers our jobs are very difficult, uh, and you know we're trying to prepare our students for the future, but we don't know what the future is going to be like for them. And just making sure that they're, they're able to use those critical thinking, those creative thinking, you know, be those curious you know, problem solvers in the future. And because learning experiences are based in inquiry instruction, the students are constructing their knowledge as they go. So they don't know the answer before they start. They're discovering the answer through the process in all in the goals to help make the world a better place. So um, I thought I'd share a few John Deweyisms that I thought were appropriate for talking about authentic learning experiences. And so one of the things here is we only think when confronted with a problem. If we teach today's students as we taught yesterday's, we rob them of tomorrow and give the pupils something to do, not something to learn. And the doing is of such a nature as to demand thinking. Learning naturally results. So I thought those fit well with the idea of those authentic learning experiences. So what do you think? Um, what benefits of authentic learning have you found? Have you used authentic learning in your classroom? If you've done so, you know, what types of things have you done? I'd like to take a minute or so to kind of see um, what types of ideas uh, we can share. All right, Christina, yes, absolutely. STEAM activities uh, with cooperative learning, um, providing those you know, opportunities to incorporate uh, those different you know, content areas and th those critical thinking skills, those habits of mind. Lenora, thank you so much for sharing. Looks like you did some uh, you know, project-based learning, you know, learning real uh, authentic learning experiences with the school garden. Fantastic. Yeah, field trips, absolutely. In person or virtual. Um, I have a, there's a resource that I'm going to share that um, virtual field trips through a Microsoft uh, Education free. Um, it's a great resource to take a look at too, to bringing um, the world to your students that way. Excellent. Well, let's just keep uh, responding to that. That chat box is open, so please share any uh, you know, ideas or thoughts you have as we're going. But we're going to dive in now to um, the second part of our uh, presentation today, and that is um, how to get started. So those authentic learning experiences in your classroom. And um, you know, uh, Lenora uh, talked about the, the garden. and. That, to me, sounded like a, a, a great example of project-based learning. And so I want to share, and maybe this is very familiar to, to you, is the uh, Buck Institute for Education, their theory on the uh, of good project-based learning, and they call this the gold standard uh, PBL. And this is what we used here at uh, the Van Andel Education Institute to build our uh, project-based learning projects. And so you can see that the content the learning goals are in the center, and the outside is that, that process or those pieces that are a part of good uh, PBL. And starting off with that challenging question, uh, making sure that it's a sustained process so it's not just a one-shot deal. You know, this is happening over multiple lessons, multiple days. Uh, there's the authenticity, that, that real-world connection, that collaboration. Uh, throughout the, the project, students have choice. They have voice. They're reflecting. They're also revising and critiquing. And they have that authentic audience, that, that public product that they're, they're sharing. And so what we did is that we took the theory and used the best parts of lesson planning and created a process or a structure to help you start using project-based learning and doing project-based learning in your classroom. So if you start with a compelling question, and I'll give you an example. We're working on a project. It's called Food for Thought. And the question is, you know, can a cookbook save your life? And it has to do with nutrition. And the students are studying about nutrition through this process. Uh, but their end product is they're going to be uh, developing, um, testing recipes that will go into a cookbook that they will publish and sell for a good cause. And so in that lesson, we 
we create this kind of five-part process where we always start with why. What is that relevancy? Uh, what is that engager, that hook? And so in the Food for Thought project, uh, the students right away are engaged by um, playing this, this game. It's called Your Heart or Mine. And they all get a, a colored card. And on those cards represents a statistic. So let's say we have so many red cards, so many green cards. And the red represents heart disease. And the green represents diabetes. And the white is you know, no disease. And, and they get these different cards. And that helps them understand you know, statistically uh, these diseases that are plaguing you know, people and how they're linked to nutrition. And so starting off with kind of that, that engage or that relevancy piece. And then once they they have that, that relevancy, then we take them through this think it through stage where they're getting all that information they need. This is where you can bring in the experts, uh, those real world connections. Um, you bring in the, the, the articles, the, the multimedia, you know, the other content, the, the instruction that they need in order to then um, start designing and developing their uh, solution or their product to this question or problem. And then they work it out. They work it out. They just do it. And then they fix it up. This is the iterative process where they're critiquing, they're revising, they're testing, and they're iterating until they're ready to share their awesome. And throughout that five-step process, we've pulled out three essential components. We believe that all good PBLs should have collaboration opportunities for students and within the classroom and outside of the classroom. They also should have those real world connections, um, those experts coming into the classroom, whether virtually or actually physically, or you know, students sharing out of the classroom to the world. And um, also interwoven is that cross-curricular content, that content that you need to teach, those standards that you need to, to teach your students. So if you take a look at the uh, gold standard models from the Buck Institute and the, the process that we just talked about, you can see the different parts and how they, they fit nicely together. And you're starting off with that compelling question and using you know, multiple lessons that sustained inquiry, providing that authenticity uh, through the real world connections, collaboration options, and throughout the project having choice for students and allowing them time to reflect and allowing them to fix it up, you know, critiquing and revising and sharing their, their awesome through that authentic audience or public product. And all the while, you know, interweaving those, those content standards that you need to address with your students. So I want to pull apart those three essential components uh, and give you some strategies that you can start using right away in your classroom. And uh, so the first one is real simple, just peer review. You know, a lot of the projects that we're developing, the students are working together uh, collaboratively, but they're also reviewing each other's work within groups or um, through different groups and revising and iterating um, before they share their awesome. So it's a great way to collaborate. Also, um, a strategy you can use is know your role. So if students are uh, forming their groups, to work on a solution to a problem, they can either uh, decide what are the roles that are needed for their project, or um, the teacher can determine those roles if, if um, it's something that they want to scaffold for their students. But having the students each know what their role is holds them accountable and is going to you know, allow for a, a more successful project. Another a collaboration idea is something called source swap. You know, through that you know, think it through process um, of that project, they're going to be, need to gather some information from multiple sources to help them begin to design, develop, and test their solution or their product. And a source swap is a great way, it's also a great way to save time in your classroom. If you have all these different um, resources for your students, like a, maybe you have a a video from an expert, and then you have an article that you want your students to read. But have them partner up within their groups and each take one of those um, sources, look at it, write down the main ideas, what are the things that they think are going to be helpful for them in their project, and then swap that with the partner in their group and decide together what are the best pieces from those sources that are going to allow 
us to move forward in this process. So it's a great way to not only review sources, but a, a good way to, to save time in your classroom, almost similar to, to a jigsaw type of activity. And then the last one there, it's starred because there's a download for you at the bottom of your screen. You see downloadable resources. It's uh, give one, get one. And this is a great way um, to uh, gather prior knowledge from students, but also to do a review at the end of a lesson or possibly a project is uh, whatever that question is or topic, have the students write three things that they know about it, and then have them get up and find a partner and share one of those things, and their partner would then share one of their ideas, and then they would go and do that to another person. So when they're all done, they'll have three things that they put down and then two ideas from other students in the classroom. And you can change the numbers however you see fit. If you wanted to do more than five, maybe you have them do you know, seven or ten or whatever it happens to be. But it's a great quick way for the students to collaborate in the classroom. Now, if we think about um, collaboration outside of the classroom walls and how can we collaborate with other classes, I wanted to share with you an example. And I um, have provided for you, this is the Prevent the Spread project that we're working on. And I have the overview there uh, in the downloadable resource if you'd like to take a look at it. Uh, but in this project, students are investigating the effectiveness of uh, detergents or, excuse me, disinfectants in the spread of bacteria, uh, but also learning about um, good habits, healthy, hygienic habits to keep those yucky germs at bay. And so the end product, the students will be creating a public service announcement that they're going to share uh, with their community, um, you know, outside, share it to the world about how to prevent the spread. And throughout that project, they're learning all about germs, all about health, and you're know, bringing in those real-world experts and collaborating. And so I wanted to share with you an idea about some cross-classroom collaboration, possibly. In, in this example, we recommend or suggest that uh, the investigation that the students go through on collecting the bacteria and testing the effectiveness of the disinfectant that if another class, whether it's in their same school or maybe a different school, is doing this same uh, experiment, their results should be somewhat similar if they're following the same plan. So um, collaborating that way and just checking for um, you know, possible discrepancies and having discussions uh, with those classrooms is, is a really powerful way uh, as the students are, are analyzing their data and coming to their, their conclusions or explanation. Other ways to collaborate in this lesson is we suggested, you know, partner up with another class to create the public service announcement or to partner with another class to get feedback on the public service announcement. And maybe it's as simple as swapping tips and tricks with another teacher who's doing uh, the same project you are doing as well, whether it's this particular project like Prevent the Spread or another project you've decided to uh, to try in your class. The second uh, component to uh, project-based learning is that real-world connections, bringing those in. And so we've divided those into basically two buckets. Bring the world to your students or bring the students to the world. And so for bringing the world to your students, this is where you're going to want to bring in your community experts. Um, scour YouTube. Look for YouTube channels for experts. Blogs are a great place to check out. Charities, uh, local charities. Uh, that are willing to come in and talk to your class about certain topics. And then also, you know, virtually looking at Skyping with an expert. So I put um, three resources there for you, links there of uh, some possible suggestions to bringing experts into your classroom virtually. There's Skype with a scientist, and uh, this you just fill out, a, you fill out a form and talk about what your needs are, and they'll match you up with a scientist to Skype in your classroom. It's pretty neat. Uh, Microsoft Community, this is a free community that offers uh, educational experiences, including field, virtual field trips, talks from guest speakers, um, classroom to classroom connection, and uh, other opportunities that way as well. So this is also great for collaboration, too. And then I just stumbled across this. I was really excited about it. It's called Nepris, and I've never heard of it before, but basically it's a company that um, connects uh, industry experts to the classroom. 
And they have you know, the free version, and then they have the paid version. And essentially, the free version, I just played around with it just recently, um, you, can, you can have access for 30 days to their video content. You can join in one live industry chat, and you can have ac access to their community as well. And then the paid version, you can actually set up um, individual sessions so where that expert will Skype directly into your classroom, and you can set that up. So that's another uh, you know, place to look if you're looking to bring uh, the world to your students. Now, the second part of that real world connections is bringing your students to the world. And you know, social media is an obvious place to start. Uh, but if the students are creating something, let's say, like a book, you can look at publishing sites. Um, here's some great examples, Book Baby, Kindle Direct Publishing, to do that. Um, maybe you want to share with your local media and you know, uh, creating a press release to do that. Maybe there is something your students, the project your students are doing, that there is a contest or a competition that the students can join in. So there's a link there for uh, a list of student competitions. And lastly here, I wanted to share uh, databases are a good place to bring your students to the world. So if the students are doing an investigation where there's a place where they can put in their data that they collect into this, whether it's a national or a global database, um, that would be a very powerful way for them to see their, their work in action. And uh, a few years ago, I did this with my students, Globe, and they collected web, weather data uh, and entered that in. And they were just so excited to see that the, the data they were collecting was going into a, a international database um, to be used you know, by other classrooms and um, you know, educators around the world. So uh, might be an interesting thing to check out. And lastly, all uh, you know, our, our project-based learning units, we have those content connections. And it's going to look different in K5 and 612, where K5, you're, you're connecting the content areas. You're taking math, science, social studies, English language arts, you know, maybe social emotion emotional learning too to the project. Where 612 might look a little different. You know, maybe you're um, connecting the content within the subject area to the project. So for example, if you're teaching, you know, if you're an earth science teacher and you want to do a project-based learning project, you may, you know, instead of just teaching rocks and, and weather and space, you connect those different units within your content area into a project. Um, some Great pieces uh, of advice as you're starting to do that is to be open-minded, be very creative, and talk to other teachers. Maybe there's a way that you can collaborate and connect with maybe the, the art teacher or the science teacher or the math teacher in your building and work together to create this, this project. And I just wanted to um, leave you with this example from a fifth grade project we're working on called Moments to Remember. And what the students are are asked to do is they um, go to a retirement home in their community and they meet a senior friend and they get to know that person, ask them questions, and in the goal of creating this memorable book about that person's life. And then they share that with that person and their, that senior friend's family at the end. And all through that, they're, they're learning about you know, the issues uh, with aging, and they're learning about um, how to create good biographies, and, you know, that process. So you think about, you know, English language arts is probably a really easy tie into that type of project. But when you think about the other subject areas, it might not be as clear. But I wanted to share with you an example from that to see that it's just having a little bit of, uh, of an open mind and creativity, how that, that is, is possible. So, for example, science. In fifth grade, uh, one of the science standards is understanding the patterns of the night sky. So uh, an idea for this project is when you go to the retirement home that you have the students find a, a senior there that has the, birthday, has the same birth month as them and then have them pull up the star chart from that person's birthday and then your student's birthday and they'll notice that that star chart, the sky chart, hasn't changed. And you know, having those conversations 
about um, you know, celestial patterns and how they change throughout the year, but from year to year in each month, they're the same. So that's a, that is an interesting, creative a way to approach that content standard in a project like this. Okay, thank you so much for your time. I just wanted to kind of um, get an idea of what, uh, what you guys are doing. How do you incorporate collaboration, real world connections, and or cross curricular content in your classroom? What other things are you doing there? So if you could just take a minute or so to kind of think about that and share your ideas, I'd love to hear them. Excellent, What's, uh, great examples here. Uh, yes, weather station collecting real weather data. What a great way too, to, to teach you know, patterns and trends and you know, possibly getting to some forecasting. Um, let's see, Lenora uh, Garden Group, excellent. So you're collaborating um, outside of the classroom, cook and using produce from the garden, fantastic. Tara, using blogs, excellent idea. Oh, escape room, students have to collaborate with their teams to get out, that's a great way to collaborate and uh, absolutely, those problem solving, those critical thinking skills, it's fantastic, thank you. Uh, I do want to let you know that um, we, I, the Prevent the Spread project overview that I mentioned is there, but also um, a list of project descriptions so that we're working on right now. It's, it's under Blue Apple Projects, and there's a list of descriptions and, or some ideas that maybe you'd like to try out yourself uh, in your classroom or maybe might spur some other ideas for some you know, um, starting points places for you to do project-based learning. But uh, I want to thank you so much for your time, um, and I'm going to turn things over to Robin now.